Hello and welcome to the fourth part in our Crusader Kings 3 tutorial series, version 1.0.3. Today we will be discussing armies, army composition, combat, and conquest. So, to start off with, what are our armies, how do we find them, and where are they located? If you look here, each individual province, it'll show you what levies they provide. And in the top right hand corner, it'll show you your total levies, your champions or knights. Depending on your culture, this may have a different name, but they operate identically as well as your man at arms. When you click the raise all armies button, they will raise at wherever you have your rally point selected. In our case, we have this province as our rally point. So as you can see here, after a few ticks, our army will raise up here. We can then disband them if we chose to do so and disband the army. If we were then to move our rally point, let's say we wanted to raid this province here, we can move our rally point over here and raise our army again. And as you can see, they will raise up like so. So you can sort of teleport your armies like that if you'd like. If you disband your army on foreign territory, it will take several months for your soldiers to walk back. So you can't just teleport your armies across the map, but you can sort of teleport them within your own domain. We're going to disband them for just a second. So the next part of this is champions. As you can see here, we have 6 out of 11. You can see your champion list by hovering over this, and like I said, there's your champions, 6 right there. Now, we have 6 out of 11, and the reason we have 6 out of 11 is because of our gallant tree. That is because we started with this completed, and we have the ability uh, right here, King's Guard, which increases the number of knights by 4. So, that, 6 because we're a duke, and 1 because of the number of territories in our domain. So, we have 6 out of 11. If we wanted to, we have somebody in our court here as a guest with 11 prowess. And we could go ahead and click recruit to court. Go ahead and get him in there. And now you'll see it ticks up to 7 out of 11. Essentially what champions are is they are just extremely powerful versions of soldiers. If you hover over the prowess skill, you can see here that each point of prowess gives a knight 100 damage and 10 toughness. The higher it is, the less likely they are to die in combat as well. So it behooves you to keep your uh, prowess skill high if you plan on leading armies so that you don't get killed by a man with a pitchfork. Men with pitchforks, on the other hand, have 10 damage and 10 toughness. So compare that to a champion with 16 martial, which would be 1600 damage and six, 160 toughness. So very, very strong. That is why... Despite the fact we only have 7 champions and 1300 levies, we have an elite quality army. As you can see with this tooltip here, it gauges the power of an army relative to the number of soldiers. In other words, it is just sort of a quick representation of how powerful the punch is on this particular number of soldiers. An army of 2000 soldiers with a low quality might have in a tough time against a 1,300 with elite quality because we're punching way above our weight class, and this is just sort of the representation of that. Men at Arms are sort of professional soldiers that are better than levies and have specific qualities. The cultural specific one for us is the Coney here, and every other troop light count here, the light footmen, bowmen, horsemen, and pikemen, are available to all cultures, all faiths, with our specific culture getting access to the special horsemen. Now, when it comes to choosing men at arms, there are two particular factors you'd like to keep uh, tabs on. One is the territory of the terrain you're going to be fighting in. For us, if you scroll into the map, so here's the realm view, if you scroll in farther, you will see that there are lots of plains around us, quite a bit in fact, and some forest alongside that. A touch of wetlands over here, but for the most part, everything within the Duchy of Poland, with a few exceptions, looks like it's plains and forest. So we might want to go ahead and stick a man-at-arms regiment that is better in forest and plains. Our cultural retinue gets 10 additional damage in plains, so instead of having 40 damage per unit, it is going to be up to 50. They have toughness, as you can see here, which is sort of their defense, and then pursuit and screen. If you look at the levies, they have zero per scrute and zero screen. 
all pursuit means is it's the amount of damage that the unit does and the aftermath of a battle. So if we win a fight, the casualties we can affect on an enemy unit is relative to the amount of pursuit that our entire army has. So as you might imagine, light cavalry is extremely good at running away enemy units. Screen, on the other hand, is if we were to lose a fight, preventing the casualties that we would take from a retreat. So if your screen is higher than the enemy's pursuit, you might actually not take all that many losses from retreating. This happens to be light footmen are better at screening than they are chasing down enemy units. Um, light horsemen are even on both fronts. And just depending on what culture you are and what units you have access to, these might change. That's just something you have to keep in mind. If you're winning a fight, pursuit is better. If you've lost a fight, you want to make sure you have screen to make sure you don't get murdered. Okay. So, as I mentioned, let's take a look at the terrain we have. So we probably want something that's good in forest or plains. If we take a look at these bowmen, they have 10 damage and 4 toughness in hills, 4 toughness, 4 screen in forests, and 4 toughness, 4 screen in taiga. Light horsemen, again, plains, drylands. So maybe we'd want to do something like that. But the second consideration is what men-at-arms do your opponents have? So as mentioned in the previous episode, we want to try to secure the High Chieftain of Greater Poland. So we're going to want to take these two territories here. So if we look at this guy, for example, we can see that he himself has 55 out of 100 light footmen that is currently reinforcing. He has 100 pikemen, and his ally has 200 light footmen. So given the composition of their army, we might want to do something that counters that. If we take a look in the menu, we can see that we have access to light bowmen, which counter skirmishers, which are the light footmen. However, our culture doesn't have access to anything that counters pikemen. However, that's no reason we can't go ahead and create a bowman retinue, and like so, it will reinforce up to the cap. As a tribal leader, it cost us prestige. If you were a feudal lord, instead of a prestige cost and a prestige cost per month, it would cost gold to create and gold per month to maintain. When they are not raised as a professional standing army, however, you still have to pay upkeep, unlike levies and champions, which cost no upkeep when they aren't currently raised. So we're gonna let this go ahead and increase. We could increase the size if we chose to do so, as you can see here, we can get up to size 3, which would be 300 troops. This increases as technology increases. The reason that is relevant is you can have at most three different men-in-arms retinue. So for instance, we could have one unit of Kony, one unit of light footmen, and one unit of bowmen. And each of those units could consist of up to 300 individual units that we can increase. So we'll go ahead and just start off with one bowman. And why not? We'll go ahead and create light footmen as well. They are also better in forest, and the Kony are a lit out, out of our price range at this moment, so we'll just let them be. We'll go ahead and create a second man at our measurement, and let them go ahead and fill up. In the meantime, while they're doing that, perhaps we can go ahead and raise our armies as raiders to show what that's about. As a pagan, we can do this, as well as our culture allows it. Catholics, for instance, have neither the culture nor the religion to raid. We do not have that issue. We have the luxury of doing so. To raise raiders, you simply click that button there. They will go ahead and do so, and simply click on a province to have them go over that way. When they get there, they will siege down the holding, and we will get some money, some loot, and perhaps some captives, all in the name of pursuing glory and gold. As you can see here, this is the siege timer. The daily progress is a base of 20 per month, and the raiding soldiers provides plus 13. That is because we have 1,300 soldiers rounded to the nearest 100, rounded down, so we get an additional 13 progress per turn. The loot is only three, so we're not gonna get a whole bunch of money out of this, but hey, you know, something is better than nothing. So when this completes, we will go ahead and get and march back to gain our prestige and our gold. If you are located somewhat near the coast, you could perhaps say be a Viking raider, put your people on boats simply by clicking across this province. We cannot do this as our culture, but if you were a Viking, you could hop on a boat and go pillage England if you so chose to do. So we will march our army back and disband them. We will go up to speed four. And as you can see here, we got three loot and three prestige. Excellent. 
and go ahead and disband our army. Now, as mentioned, we're going to want to go ahead and take a look at potentially taking this province. So, what we're going to do is we're going to move our rally point yet again. You don't have to do this, of course. This is somewhat micro. You could just leave it here or leave it on your capital, as is the default if you wanted to. I like to move the rally point around rather than create a whole bunch of rally points, but do whatever works best for you. So, we're going to go ahead and get into this, and um, we are going to let our men at arms retinue go ahead and build up. And once they have done so, we're going to declare the war. So we're going to go ahead and just speed along really quick while we wait for that to happen. Now, as you can see, we also only have 7 out of 11 champions. If we wanted to get more, we could potentially invite people to court if they wanted to come. You can do that through the find character thing and potentially find somebody that wants to join our court, although it's not particularly likely. For instance, uh, well, this man has landed, but... For the most part, you're not going to be able to invite people too often. Uh, the more likely, if you're a smaller holding specifically, you're going to have to go to the decision menu. And if you have enough prestige to do it, you can invite champions. We are missing 70 prestige, but three people with at least 12 prowess will arrive as guests in our court, whom we can then recruit as a champion. Right now, 7 out of 11 is good enough for us, so we're just going to continue on and let our men-at-arms build up. For each unit, they build up 10 per month, so this bowman reinforces at a rate of 10 per month. If we had 3 size unit, it would restore at 30 per month. So it is a 1 to 1 correlation there. And we're going to go ahead and go on speed 5. I have a son that was born. We're not going to go too much into that this year. He in inherited robust from my wife she has the third tier of amazonian and as you can see he picked up the second tier as discussed in the first episode we will go ahead and name it after an ancestor and call it a day our realm is secure so just a few more months here we're building up some money building up some prestige and getting some soldiers okay with that tick we now have a fully reinforced army and let's go ahead and declare war over this barony if you hover over an enemy, you can see it gives a rust estimation. It says our strength is similar to theirs. It'll show any allies beneath them and the troop composition. So they have four champions, 757 levies, and all these troops themselves. And their ally has 200 light footmen. So that's how you read that. So let's go ahead and give it a shot nonetheless. Why not? We're going to go over war for this particular barony. So we're going to go ahead and click the de Declare War button. It will cost us 50 piety. Go ahead and get in there, and war has been declared. We'll get this notification because our armies are not raised, and we get the Conquest of Greater Poland started. If we thought we were losing this war, we could potentially hire mercenaries. They cost gold, as you can see here. We cannot afford any of them. One thing to keep in mind if you have mercenaries for a particularly large uh, army that consists of lots of monthly income retinents. If you go into debt, your advantage is reduced by 10. When we get into combat, I'll go into further detail of advantage, but keep that in mind when hiring mercenaries, that if your gold goes below your total amount, they become much worse in combat. It's not as detrimental as it was in CK2, but it's something to keep in mind nonetheless. So, let's raise our armies. We can see here, we currently are in charge. We have a commander advantage of 25. We get five because we are leading our own soldiers. Anytime your character is leading an army, they get an additional plus five regardless of our martial skill. And then it is a one-to-one -one correlation based on our martial. We have 15 martial, therefore we gain 15 additional advantage. And never back down is a trait that we have from our gallant tree. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize, I didn't actually hover over it. There it is right there. So we get five additional advantage as a commander. Our prowess is also 18. So this is only relevant for two things, dying in combat and as a commander, or sorry, as a champion. Because we are the commander of the army, our prowess isn't used. If, however, we were to put one of our other champions in there, the prowess becomes relevant. And that deals the damage in correlation to the thing we discussed earlier about champions and their damage and toughness. Okay, so let's go ahead and march our way into this province here. As you can see, he is raising soldiers. 
because he is in the terrain of the forest, he will have a defensive battle, and the game will give you an overview. It says that they have higher quality. It says that they are defending in a forest, which is a detriment, but we have more men in arm counters. This is just sort of a rust estimation of what the game thinks will happen. As we scroll in here, we're gonna go ahead and march down. As you can see, the enemy ally has joined the war. We do wanna pick a fight because I'd like to show this off. So hopefully we can get one. We will chase this army down so we can go into detail about advantage and combat. Okay, we are going to catch him. As we can see, we are going to get there on April the 20th. He is going to get there on May the 4th, so there will be a battle. Okay, so this is the battle overview. As you can see, this is our advantage on the right, just being a commander. This is the advantage of the commander on the left. In addition, there would be any terrain modifiers. Plains has no terrain modifier. Something like Forest, on the other hand, would provide a plus three advantage to the defender, which would be located in this right here. As you can see, unreformed pagans also get a combat bonus. They are also unreformed pagans, so they get an additional 10. And there are the different modifiers. So what does advantage do? As you can see here, there is a 2% increase in damage for every um, advantage point in your favor. So, if the enemy had a better commander, let's say this was flipped, and he had a commander score, or rather a marshal of 30 instead of 10, this would be at negative 5 for us, and we'd be taking 10% additional damage. In addition to that, we're going to see some down here. Right now, our bowmen are countered by his coney. As you can see here, he has 65 out of 100. They counter bowmen, as we saw in the men-at-arms list, and so therefore are countering us. The way it works is that each individual unit counters at half the ratio. So if we have a hundred bowmen, and he has a hundred light footmen, as you can see here, he's only dealing 55% damage. With 65 light cavalry, we are dealing 70% damage. So it's not a one-to-one -one relation, but about half minus 5%. So our light footmen are dealing their damage, their pikemen are dealing full damage, and that is because nothing is countering them. So that's how that works. You can also overview and see how much damage each individual thing is doing. As we can see here, they are fighting in favorable terrain, so they deal a whopping 50 damage individually, something to keep in mind for engagements. Our seven champions, our four champions, and the dice roll for combat. I know this is a lot to go over, but hopefully it's making sense so far. Similar to EU4, there is a dice roll in combat. Let's go ahead and slow this down. As time passes, the new dice roll will occur. We can see losses that are going to take place on the third day. We have now moved on to the early, early battle phase. And now, as you can see, troops have taken damage. 45 of the enemies have routed. That does not mean they're actually dead. It simply means that they are a casualty that has left the battlefield. We can pursue them down later. The advantage is now five, and the reason for that is battle roll. So. Even though we rolled a 0 and they rolled a 10, we still have the 5 combat advantage increasing our damage by 10%. The reason is, we went from 15 to 5. So that's all the combat rolls do. They go from 0 to 10, and they increase the advantage in your favor or decrease the advantage in your favor. At most, worst case scenario, what we just rolled here, for instance, they're with rolling a 0 and them rolling a 10, that is a 20% damage difference. So while it can be impactful to get really good rolls, unless the fight is extremely even, it's not a big deal. We went from dealing 30% damage to dealing 10% damage. We can go to anywhere from dealing 10% additional damage to dealing 50% additional damage. There is no other variable. It is the initial advantage you started from, plus or minus 2% for each dice roll. I hope that makes sense. And time passes, the next dice roll will occur in a few days. As we can see here, we roll a 2, they roll a 7. Now combat advantage is 10. Our champion has maimed one of their champions. Combat continues. More dice rolls, more fights. 
our archers are now dealing more damage. As you can see here, we're now dealing 81% damage rather than 70. And the reason is some of his light cavalry have died. Meanwhile, his light footmen are only dealing 50% damage. And that is because we have 85 light footmen to his 41. Or sorry, I apologize. We have 77 bowmen to his 41. So we outnumber them almost 2 to 1. So they're barely doing anything. Combat continues. We got a good roll there. We're now dealing 18. Very nice. And as you can see, we have now gone to the late battle phase. At this point, you can either manually choose to retreat or the game will do it automatically when the combat has concluded. So in theory, if we were a player character and this was going terribly, we could manually choose to click off and say, try to run away. The next phase of combat now begins. As you can see, there are zero troops left actually fighting, and there are 718 routed. At the next phase, we are now in the aftermath phase because he had no more troops, and at this point, our pursuit values will now try to chase down and turn some of these enemy casualties into permanent ones. Our pursuit is not particularly high because the only thing with pursuit is our bowmen, and they have a decent amount of screening, so we might actually not deal too much. At the end of the day, we actually only ran down seven units. So, as you saw in the aftermath there, we really didn't kill too much. This is the overview that you can see here. It gives you the kill-loss ratio. Our levies inflicted 139 and took 85. Our champions, as mentioned, were extremely powerful. We had some very good ones. They got 136 kills with just 7 champions. So champions with good prowess really punch above their weight class. This is a very important factor in determining how fights turn out. Do not disregard individual champions. Our bowmen did a decent job. Mostly, they prevented the screening of their light footmen. As you can see, by countering their light footmen, they really only racked in two kills. Not bad. The main phase overview here, as you can see, and then the pursuit phase, where, as I mentioned, we really didn't get much kills because we don't have a lot of pursuit in this army, and they actually have a decent amount of screening. So that's how combat works. That's how advantage works. Next, we're going to go ahead and siege down his holding really fast so that we can win this war for good. We have captured an enemy combatant. You can find any captured people by going to the court menu by either clicking F5 or these little people here, and then going to prisoners. You can ransom them if you want to, he will accept, or you can just let them go for favors or hooks. We'll go into detail later. For now, we'll just let him out for 10 gold. He was one of the champions. So he doesn't provide any war score value, so we'll just let him go for some money. The prisoner has been released, and we will siege down the holding. Now, suppose we didn't want to have our entire unit stuck here. Perhaps we wanted to chase down some soldiers or take out these guys who are recently disembarked. What we can do is, once we arrive at the province, which will happen in several days, specifically on the 3rd of June, we can do one of two things. We can either select our besieging army and then click this Station Besiegers button, the game will automatically disband enough troops to lead the siege, or you can choose to do it manually. And the way you do that is split off into new army and detach regiments. So in general, you want your levy sieging because they're not particularly great in combat. So we'll leave our levy there, we'll take everybody else with us in charge, and we'll run down this other army. So they will continue to siege at one progress per day. In theory, because we are a siege leader, we could be assisting this, for example, if we put ourselves in charge. First, we need to remove ourselves from this one, because we are in charge of this commander. So let's put our champion involved there, and put ourselves involved here. And with our siege leader trait, you're now going to notice that instead of taking 20 days, it only takes 14. So we can siege this down even faster. However, I think we serve a better benefit being in charge of this army, given how great we are, with a whopping 25 advantage. So we're just going to remove the commander, let them siege it down, and put ourselves in charge of this one. Okay. We're going to take attrition because it is so far away from land we control, but we're going to get the fight in here. As you can see, they're fighting in favorable terrain. There's 200 of them to our 85 bowmen. As a result, they're still dealing 81% damage. Again, if you're even, as in they hold 100, we hold 100, it does 55% damage. In this case, because they're outnumbering us 2 to 1, and we're already missing units, it's not quite as effective. Nonetheless, we have a great combat advantage in our favor, because we are amazing. In addition, there is Sanctity of Nature. 
a doctrine bonus that we are getting because we are attacking in forest. So we will just wrap this army up and look at the overview. Right now they are in the retreat phase and we can look at the army overview. It'll tell you the terrain and it'll give you all the rundown. Okay, so that's how that works. Let's just go ahead and march back and get this siege done and move this, end this war as quickly as possible. When armies retreat, they shatter retreat and they try to go to either allied controlled, the farthest allied controlled province so they can't get run down. If they don't have an option, they will retreat to neutral territory. So let's go ahead and finish this siege. The way sieges work, this is the garrison, this is the garrison health, and this is the walls. If you have siege equipment, you can potentially break the walls and reduce the siege timer. Otherwise, let's hope to get an event here. In 14 days, we will get one. And we got supplies running low. So then, this went from fully supplied to running low. As you can see, seed progress gained one time increase of 10%. So this hopped up 10%. We got 20 siege progress just from that alone. The next event will occur in 14 days. Sometimes disease will spread among the garrison, as you can see here. Disease outbreak, the resulting additional 10% progress in the siege. And this will just continue. You can get status quo, you can get disease outbreak. Essentially, either nothing's going to happen, this will reduce, this will reduce, or you will siege the walls. That is the one of the four things that can happen. Desertion happen, so five siege progress. Not five percent, but just five flat out progress. Uh, we got another desertion event, another five progress. We have a lifestyle perk that has opened up. Let's just go ahead and select cost spell a cost minus 50%. Why not? And voila, we have captured his daughter for an additional war score. So we almost have 100%. He'll almost accept. Let's go ahead and see if we can just beat this army and then get this war over with. Now, we don't really want to cross a river. That will incur a 10 advantage penalty. Looks like he's actually going to move away for us. So let's wait a day to let him get far. He's going to get there on the 20th, 22nd, and then we'll take the fight in this territory here. We are going to get there on the 3rd. He's going to get there on the 4th. Excellent. Hopefully that'll give us enough war score to end this war. My wife is pregnant again. Let's just go ahead and zoom through this. We're not going to slow it down. Our champion was slain, unfortunately. Quite a good champion as well, if I believe. Champion was maimed. Combat rolls and a victory. There we go. Unfortunately... Oh, I'm sorry. Pro prowess of 4. I thought she was the one with 16. No problem. No worries at all. Feels bad, but not the end of the world. So, he is movement locked, I believe, which is why he's having to battle here. And as you can see... We are in a great shot here. Our champion was wounded, and we entirely wiped out the army completely. We killed every single troop. Our war score is now 100, so let's go ahead and end this war. Dismiss these. We will gain 75 fame. We will gain... Seven, uh, our allies, if we had any in this war, would gain up to 75 prestige. We do not gain any prestige ourselves. Let's go ahead and enforce this demand. So he says some stuff to us, some rude words, and we gain the county. Now, the control is zero. And that reduces the levies by 50% and the taxes in 100. As discussed in the council video, what we can now do is... Sorry, I apologize, not fabricate. What we can now do is assign our marshal to increase control in the county. And in eight years, the county will be up to 100 control. It takes a good degree of time, 0.6 per month because of our counselor, 0.3 per month because of our lifestyle choice, and 0.1 per month because of the base value. So that concludes our tutorial on the basics of combat conquest, advantage, champions, levies, and men at arms. I hope that was informative. And as always, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.